of building together on the solid ground. And I don't think I can overemphasize it enough of how important it is to have Jesus as our rock, our firm foundation rooted in, in God and in Jesus, because he's the author and the perfecter of our faith. He's the reason why we're here. And so this morning, as we recognize and celebrate the enduring legacy of Mr. and Mrs. Spark, of their commitment of their, of, to their marriage, I know that the, the love that they both share is because of the foundation that they've had in Jesus Christ. It's, he's the, been the one that's sustaining them from the very beginning. And it's not just that their devotion and love for one another that makes their lives stronger. And that's not what makes it so incredible, but it's because of the mighty strong statement of their love for God that has been rooted and grounded in his love. Bub and Georgia are a living example of God's intention for marriage. They're a reflection of the biblical concept of covenant. And they're a witness to the world of God's amazing love. Their lifelong commitment to each other is a powerful testimony of God's intention for marriage. 75 years of marriage, of, of commitment, of covenant to the same person that was made before many of us were even born. I've, I've not met any, yeah, many of us. I've not met anyone else in the world who can say that. And so it's an honor and a privilege to be able to know you two and to be able to celebrate the legacy that y'all have left. Over in the book of Ephesians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul prays specifically for believers to be rooted and grounded in God's love, that they would have a foundation of love, and that they would be filled to the fullness of God. And that's my prayer for you and for this church this morning, that as we seek to live and to grow on the solid rock of Jesus Christ, that we would be firmly rooted in God's love so that everything we do is, is bathed in love. Every goal we set, every move we make, Every ministry, everything we say and everything we do is because of love and it's rooted in love. This is what we're to be about. Jesus gave us the greatest commandments to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Because if we are truly connected to the foundation of Jesus Christ, then we can't help but be about love. This is what makes the gospel such good news. John 3, 16, because God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever will believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The only reason we know anything about love is because God first loved us. But before we go any further, I'd like to read this prayer that's found in Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to be starting in verse, 13, verse 14. It says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. In this letter to the Ephesians, Paul is writing to a group of Gentile believers, first-time Christians, believers who uh, wouldn't have grown up hearing about the stories in the Bible and the Old Testament that we, many of us, have heard in Sunday school and vacation Bible school. They wouldn't have had that foundation of the Torah and other biblical stories that the Jews would have known. But Paul, in this letter, in the first tr three chapters especially, is passionate about preaching the deep truths of the gospel to them. And so he explains to these Gentiles that they, because of God's grace and because of God's mercy, they are fellow heirs to the throne of God. They are fellow members of the body and they are fellow partakers of the promise that's in Jesus Christ and in the gospel. 
You see, God loves them out there. Christ died for them, too, not just us in the church. Sometimes we forget that. I know the Jews had forgotten that, too. And that's another beautiful thing about the gospel. It, does, it doesn't matter who you are or where you've been or what you've done. God loves you. He loves you, and he wants to have a relationship with you, a deep and growing relationship with you, one that he showers his love upon you. You and I are fellow heirs of this promise. We're fellow members of this body. We're fellow partakers of this promise of the gospel when we accept his love for us. And before Paul moves on to applying these deep truths of the gospel, he prays this prayer for the Gentiles. And as Christians, I just want to pause here for a moment and talk about how important prayer is. Prayer is, is an essential part of who we are. We are to be people who are characterized by love and by prayer. And as we talk more and more about building together on the solid ground, it's vital to our work. It's vital to our service and to our entire, entire lives that we value prayer. That we understand how big our God is and that he is able to do far more than we could ever ask or imagine. So we need to involve him. He's, he's our guide. He's our director. We're doing it for him in the first place. So everything we need to do needs to be guided by God. Because if not, we're in danger of building on another foundation that will never produce the spiritual fruit we're called to bear. That's why Paul here asks God to intervene on their behalf. He prays for them. He doesn't just tell them about the spiritual truth and what they're supposed to do. He, he prays for them, saying, God, help them to grow. Help them to be rooted and grounded in your love. And it's important to know that, that Paul is praying for them to be rooted and grounded in God's love. Not this version of love you hear about people singing on the radio or on TV these days. It, love is not defined by some type of feeling or emotion. Real love is what we have seen on display in the lives of Mr. and Mrs. Sparks. A true commitment of love and care for someone else other than yourself. And that goes contrary to everything our flesh wants to do because we're selfish. But their commitment, their love, is a true picture of the love God desires to share with us, one that's committed for more than 75 years for all eternity. And in addition to the powerful display of love we see here today, there are a couple of words I want us to look at in scripture that describe the love of God and what we're to be rooted in. The first one is the Hebrew word hesed. Hesed. And it's interesting, the Hebrew is actually written backwards. So you would start with revelation and, and turn it over. And you read it from right to left instead of left to right. But hesed is this word used over and over again in the Old Testament. Over 250 times, hesed is used. And it reveals an important part of who God is, that he is faithful, that he's committed, that he's devoted, even to a people who were unfaithful, that he is compassionate and loving and affectionate and merciful, even to those who had forgotten him. We read an example of Hesed in Exodus 34, 6, and also the same words are found in Psalm 103, 8. It says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious slow to anger and abounding in hesed and truth. And it's difficult to adequately describe this word in English because we live in a much different context today. We, we don't n understand the backstory of, of all the, the loving kindness that God had displayed for them to a people who were rebellious to him. But it's the idea of faithful and committed affection that is put into action. And ultimately, this was on display in the life of Jesus Christ as he came to the earth to, to die for our sins, to pay the penalty for our sins, to establish a new covenant with us. And, and Jesus said it himself, that there is no greater love than this than for a man to lay down his life for his friends. And that's what he did. And the reason this word hesed is so powerful 
is because, and, and so hard for us to understand, is because it's connected to another word we find a lot in the Old Testament, and it's this idea of covenant, which is also unfamiliar to us because today we, we sign contracts. You buy a house, you sign a contract. You start a new job, you sign a contract that you're going to do that job. And unfortunately, many marriages today are built on contracts, which is really just an agreement for two people to legally live together, and it can be broken or annulled if one or both of them decide to end their part of the agreement. A contract is motivated by selfish desire to get something in return. You pay the rent, so you get to live in that house. You do your job, so you get to get paid in return. But if that expectation is not met, then the contract can be dissolved. You can decide to destroy the contract. And we see this pl take place in so many marriages today. And cause, because when being together is no longer fun and exciting, I, I can, the contract is null and void. I can move on. Or when circumstances change, or when the storms of life come, I, I just wasn't expecting for us th to go through this, so I'm just going to break it up. The contract can be reconsidered legally and ultimately terminated. On the other hand, a covenant is a personal commitment and a permanent commitment. It's a solemn and binding relationship that is meant to last a lifetime, as we see in this example today of Mr. and Mrs. Sparks. And throughout Scripture, we see God cutting a covenant, establishing covenants with his people, the first time this word is used is with Noah as him and his family get off the ark and God makes a covenant that he will no longer flood the entire earth again. And he put a rainbow in the sky as a symbol of the covenant. He also made a covenant with Abraham to make his descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And he kept that promise to Isaac and to Jacob and to the people of Israel. God made a covenant with Moses and the people of Israel in the wilderness when he gave him the Ten Commandments. And he made a covenant with David that one of his heirs would reign on the throne, be a, be a ruler who brings about peace on earth. And God was faithful to all of these promises. Even when his people did not keep their end of the bargain, God was faithful. Because covenants in Scripture are between God and man, but also we see covenants in Scripture between other human beings. We see a covenant between Jacob and his uncle Laban. We see a covenant between Ruth and Naomi, between Jonathan and David. But all of these covenants were promises that were made in the witness of God as, and an unconditional commitment to the other as they ground their vows in the faithfulness of God. The Hebrew word for covenant in the Old Testament is berit, very yeet, which in English and with a Texas slang can just be bear it. You know, you could just say bear it, okay? That, that'll be that you'll say a covenant word, uh, the Old Testament co word for covenant. But can you bear it? Can you bear a covenant on your own? And I don't think so. I think we need to have the love and the, 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 the kindness, the, the grace of God in our lives. May we be strengthened by his strength to go through with the covenant. He, only he can bear it. And that's why a biblical, biblical covenant is made in the presence of God and rooted in him who is forever, forever faithful. This whole idea of covenant puts an end to independent living. It's, it's no longer about you. It's never been about you. But this idea of, of cutting a covenant, of making a covenant with someone, with God, it's, it's, it means you're, you're giving up your rights. It runs counter to the, the, to the world, the way the world is. Instead, it's a promise. It's a promise that's committed beyond feelings or beyond circumstances. You're committed to that covenant. It's sacred, and it's a solemn vow that's faithful beyond what we can bear on our own. It takes seriously the vows that are being made, and it's a promise that is made for the benefit of the other person not for oneself. And a primary reason that covenant relationships endure over contractual ones is because they're not based on whether or not the other person holds up their end of the bargain. 
is committed to the other regardless of what happens. And there's no illustration that more accurately describes this intimate relationship of marriage than of covenant. When Ashley and I were going through premarital counseling, before we got married, uh, we, we heard this phrase, and it stuck with us this whole time, and it, it says, it takes three for two to become one. It takes three for two to become one. Because that's how God intended it for, to be. It, it involves the husband, the wife, and God. For them to become one in unity. A marital covenant is not, not only is made in the presence of God, but it is rooted in God's love. In order for a marriage covenant to last and become what it is intended to be, it must, be, it must keep him at the center. It must be rooted in his love. So we've talked about hesed, the loving kindness of God throughout the Old Testament, it's the steadfastness and affection of God. We talked about covenant, how it's greater than a contract. It, it's a solemn vow, binding relationship that puts the other first. And the next word is the Greek word agape, which describes an unconditional type of love. Although in English we only have one word for love, we just say I love tacos and I love my wife in the same sentence. In, in, in the Greek there are several different uh, words for love. There's phileo love, which is a brotherly type of love. There's eros, which is a romantic type of love. There's sterge, which is affection between parents and children, affection for someone else. And in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul goes in depth about this agape type of love to describe what it actually is. He says, love is patient and kind. It does not envy it does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always hopes, always trusts, always perseveres. Love never fails. Bub and Georgia are teaching us about this agape type of love. What it means to enter into a covenant relationship. One that's not self-seeking. One that rejoices with the truth. Always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And a love that never fails. The amazing thing about being rooted and grounded in the love of God is that his love doesn't just stay there. It continues to grow. It grows deeper and deeper. We cannot understand how deep the Father's love is for us. He sent his one and only Son to die on the cross for our sins. The prayer of Paul for the believers in Ephesus is that they are rooted and grounded in God's love, that they would grow in their understanding of how great his love is. He prays that they would have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide, how long, how deep, how high the love of God is. Paul is talking about a deeper understanding of God's love that is realized not through our intellect. We can't study it enough to realize how deep God's love is for us. It must be experienced. And as Christians, we've experienced God's love. We know what it means. We've seen it on display in our, in our own lives and in the lives of others, how much God loves us. We can't take God's love to the lab or measure it and say, man, it's, it's this deep, or it's this, it go, it'll go this long, and then it'll stop. It's something that's immeasurable. It's something that must be experienced by you. Have you ever heard the quote, I will love you more today than I loved you yesterday, and I will love you even more tomorrow? I will love you more today than I loved you yesterday, and I will love you even more tomorrow. Now, I love my wife, Ashley, with all that's within me. I love her to the maximum, to the, over and above anything I could ever imagine, I love her so much. I can't even possibly imagine loving her even more. But I know that our love each day continues to grow. It grows even more, more than I could ever imagine. And the next day, more than I could ever imagine. And it's truly a result of God's love for us. 
being rooted and grounded in his love. It's, it's not something that we can measure or even be able to picture the depth of it without being a part of it. And as Mr. and Mrs. Sparks, as you celebrate 75 years of marriage, I cannot even fathom how much love there is in that relationship. I can't, I can't even picture it. I know the love I have between Ashley and I, and we've been married for six years, which seems like a little baby compared to you guys. 75 years of marriage. I can only imagine the depth of that love. And because each day, each year, you love each other even more. That's amazing. Being rooted and grounded in God's love doesn't mean you just are, are poured in like concrete and you just sit there and stay. It's rooted, it's grounded, it's, it's growing in God's love. It's not just holding on to him, but it's growing in every direction. God's love is wide enough to include all of humanity. I mean, it's this wide. You know, you've seen those kids, I love you this much. God's love is so wide, it includes all humanity. His love stretches across the entire globe to include people from all tribes, all tongues, all nations, everywhere. Everyone who's ever lived, God has loved them. It's long enough to last for all eternity. His love never stops. And his word repeatedly reveals that his love endures forever, throughout your life here on earth and throughout all eternity. His love never ends. It's deep enough to reach even in the deepest, darkest pits of evil and sin. His love is so deep that there's nothing you can do, no matter how far away you've gone, no matter how dark the pit uh, is that you're in, God's love will go there to pursue you. His love is so deep that he went to the deepest and darkest place to save you and me so that we could spend eternity with him. His, his love is high enough to, to be above any other type of love. And that's why we have to come up with Greek and Hebrew words to try and describe it because our language, we, don't even, we can't even fathom it. We have, to, we have to talk about unconditional love, agape, his hesed, his loving kindness and affection, selfless love, a love that never ends. It's, it's so high it reaches to the heavens and it's the greatest form of love we could ever know. In our text today, it's, it's as if Paul invites us to look at the universe, to the limitless sky above, to the limitless horizons on every side, to the depth of the earth, and to the seas beneath us, and said, the love of Christ is as measureless as that. And here in West Texas, you can see for a long ways. It's wider than that. It goes further than that. No one is outside the love of Christ. No one is outside the love of Christ. And so you, you know what that means for us is that we are called to love others, no matter who they are, where they've been, or what they've done. And I love this in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anyone, anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. When I was in junior high, my dad and I, and, and younger, when I was at, at that age, uh, we, we would go to the nursing home and we would sing on Tuesday mornings at, I think, 9 o'clock. We would sing, my dad would give a devotional, and my dad could play the piano, and so I just went along and I sang with him. But I was often introduced to some of the old hymns that I had never heard of before, or that, you know, I, I just didn't know about. Like, I mean, they, these, these people were digging deep in the nursing home. <laughs> we, we, were, we, we, were, we were taking requests, and we, we came upon this song that, that I, this is what I'm going to end with today, and it's called The Love of God by Frederick Lehman. And I believe it, it, it expresses how deep, how wide, how long, and how high the love of God is. I just want to read a few of these words. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. 
his erring child, he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. And the most moving verse in the hymn is the last one. And I found it interesting that it was penciled by a man who was considered to be demented in an asylum. And these lines were discovered after his death. I'm not going to sing it for you. But it says, could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every, every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. Even in the asylum, the place where the world had given up on him, this man had felt and experienced the depth of God's love. And the same is true for you and me today as the music team comes up as we get ready for our invitation. No matter where you are or where you find yourself, God's love is there. You can't run from it. You can't hide from it. God's love is there. But I want you to do more than just hear me describe it to you. I don't want you just to believe what I've said. I want you to experience it for yourself. I want you to experience God's amazing love for you. To know that Jesus died on the cross for your sin. That, that God sent his only son to save you from your sin to rescue you, and to share eternity with you. God loves you with his amazing, abundant, selfless, affectionate, compassionate, faithful love. So will you accept God's love for you? Because no matter how far away you think you are from him, God still loves you. God still wants to have a relationship with you. No matter how, no matter if you've even given up on him, he still loves you. And even if you've heard about the love of God and you've received him into your life at one point, God doesn't want to just keep you there. He wants to grow. He wants his love to grow. He wants to open up the gates of his love and shower you with his love. Is your life rooted in God's love? in his loving kindness, in his hesed, in his agape love. I pray that you would allow God to, to love you even more, that you would open up your heart and allow God's love to pierce your heart so that you would grow in his love, that you would experience his love in such a powerful way that your life is rooted and grounded in him and that you're committed to loving him with all of your heart, and that you are committed to loving others as well. Many of us have allowed the love of God to only scratch the surface of our hearts. We've only just heard about it. We haven't let, let him affect us. He wants to go deeper. He wants to go wider. He wants to go longer. He wants to take us higher. God's love is what has given us life and endurance. God's love is what has given Bub and Georgia the commitment, the covenant that they've made with each other because they've been committed to loving him first. May we follow their example of love in all of our relationships, that we would be willing to have our lives rooted in God's love. So as we prepare to move on to this time of invitation, I want to close with these with the closing of Paul's prayer here in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. We're going to enter into a time of invitation. I'm going to ask you to stand at this time. If you've made that decision to follow Christ and to accept his love, I want to I help you walk with you through that. See what that means for your life. 
If you've never uh, been baptized and would like to follow the Lord in baptism, now's the time to come forward. Make that public profession. Or if, you're, uh, if you'd like to join our church, now's the time to come forward. Please come.